Hello. Today I'm here with you with a reading of Philip Larkin's The Witch and Weddings. Uh, before moving on to the uh, reading and analysis of the poem, let me add a couple of points. Uh, first, about Philip Larkin's being part of a movement in poetry called The Movement. Why The Movement? Because uh, they, they wanted to make a big change in what was the current trend of English poetry, especially the trend related to W.B. Yeats and, well, to the Welsh Dylan Thomas. Uh, Witson, um, the, the writer, the poet of Wetson Wedding, Philip Larkin, and uh, some of his friends like Dan Davy, they thought that uh, all these romanticism, personal poetry, or as they called it, the philosophy of the plants and uh, poems like Fernhill had corrupted the taste of the of the English readers of the poem. So they wanted to to change the taste in poetry of the people. They wanted to control it somehow because uh, they thought that all oh, these wars, the, the, these poets are anyway post World War poets. So they thought that these wars are maybe happening because of all this disheveled, unorganized, disorderly way of living. And uh, they thought that poetry is also responsible. That if poetry is too personal, if poetry is wavering around different topics about nature, about philosophies of plants and things like that, it's not controlling what the people are learning. It's not affecting uh, the cultural attitude of the people. So uh, they, they thought that poetry is responsible for all these, and they thought that if um, if poetry become organized, if poetry becomes orderly, then the minds of the people will also be so. And as a result of that, when the people can think their logical faculties are working, they, they, they no more think about an irrationality like war. So they thought that maybe this is um, an, an influential way of changing the minds of the people. And by, by changing their taste in poetry, uh, they thought that they can also change uh, the culture and also the future of the people. This was the first uh, point about uh, Philip Larkin. And uh, one more uh, important thing uh, to know before reading his poetry is what he calls uh, a little Englandism. Um, he thinks that, uh, the, that England is important. Why? Uh, as he's writing after the Second World War, and uh, England is uh, gradually becoming a post-colonial kind of country in itself. So the English people are experiencing losing one colony after another, uh, and uh, and the the uh, uh, let, let's say the expense of the country is. Um, uh, shrinking uh, and shrinking and shrinking every day. They are now a small island uh, in far corner of Europe. Uh, and he thinks that um, instead of thinking about that big empire, there should be a focus on, on the country in itself, on England. So that, that's why in this poem and other poems, we see the landscape of England, we see uh, the depth of the cultural life of the people, wits and weddings uh, in themselves are part of the English culture. So he is emulating and uh, re-embodying what is originally English. English uh, meaning what is located geographically in that island um, and his culture is now part of uh, the poems of people like him. Um, and about, let, let me add something else about the technique, his, his poetic technique, his, what is his poetics, if we want to talk about it. His poetics is a combination or a mix of anecdote or storytelling and critique or critical attitude. So while he's narrating a story or something like that, he's also showing up with a critical attitude. This is uh, the way we can summarize his poetry or the techniques he used mm, in most of his poems. So now let us go to reading the, the Wits and Weddings. Uh, it, actually, 
the Whit Sunday is the seventh Sunday after Easter, and originally it was to celebrate and commemorate Pentecost. Uh, in Pentecost, uh, many people were converted to Christian church, and uh, therefore they they wore white robes. Originally, it was uh, the time that uh, the Holy Spirit met the apostles in Jerusalem. But but, but anyway, the, the point is that uh, the people were the, the people of the church, the men who were in the church, wore white at the day, or white robes. Uh, and because of these, um, and mixing this uh, religious tradition with uh, the, the cultural heritage of the people, the British government decided in the 1950s uh, to extend uh, this white robe from the church, uh, from the people of the church, uh, to another uh, another thing which is happening in the church, marriage. So because anyway, the marriage day, the wedding day is the day in which the bride wears white. Uh, so so they, they, they thought they can mix these two ideas together. And uh, the tax law in the Whitson weekend, in the uh, last uh, Saturday and Sunday, um, uh, actually, uh, of the season, um, they, they, they laxed the taxes so that it was an advantageous uh, period of time uh, for uh, for the, the people who were um, who were not affording um, luxurious marriage or something like that. So uh, this is how Whitson wedding uh, is part of the English culture in the 1950s and now. Uh, in this poem, uh, we see uh, the point of view of Philip Larkin about it. Uh, he talks about a specific wet sun, so he, um, he or the speaker of the poem is experiencing the wet sun himself, but not as uh, the bridegroom or even the bride. So let's see uh, where he's standing in the story. That wet sun, I was late getting away, not till about 1.20 on the sunlit Saturday that my three quarters empty train pull out. So it's a Saturday, it's uh, the weekend, uh, the with sun weekend, and um, he's on a train and this journey is going to start. So this can be a literal journey and also a metaphorical one. Uh, we see how, um, how the poet um, begins with some ideas and ends up with others, and um, maybe the change change of mind even happening at the end of the poem. And also, uh, we can see the journey of the train in the inland of the country, so we can have a grasp or a picture of of what is England in itself. So uh, the the train is um, more than half empty because. Uh, on the way, uh, the newlywed couples are going also to uh, to use this train. So the train is a one which is supposed to uh, to take some um, some uh, newlywed couples into London. All windows down, all cushions hot, all sense of being in a hurry gone. And you see, the poem also follows the idea that the, the poem uh, moves slowly. Uh, the, and not much ideas are introduced in these lines. We ran behind the backs of houses, uh, crossed a street, and you see the minute detailed uh, descriptions of the poet of blinding windscreens, uh, smelt the fish duck vents. And you see he uses different forms of imagery uh, so, so that we can uh, also feel what he's feeling. The river's level drifting breaths began where sky and Lincolnshire and water meet. Uh, let me show you. Uh, this is where sky, Lincolnshire and water met. So suppose that you're on a train and you're passing uh, the scene and you see the sky, the city, Lincolnshire, and uh, the river. So the, he is describing somehow this scene. All afternoon, through the tall heat that slapped for miles inland, and we are now reading about the inland of England. Inlands are parts of the country which 
um, do not have direct access to, uh, uh, to to open waters, to open waters of water or to the seas or the oceans. A slow and stopping curve southwards we kept and you see still the tempo of the poem is a, as a, let's say, uh, mm, mm, slow one, like, like the train itself, white farms went by, short shadowed cattle, and canals with floating of industrial froth. So we see beauties of nature, we can see industry, and canals with floating of industrial froth, and these are the critiques maybe he is um, loading his anecdote with. A household flashed uniquely, a hot house, sorry, a hot house is a kitchen garden, something like that. Um, a hot house flushed uniquely, hedges dipped in rows, and as the, and the hedges are dipping and uh, dipping and rising as the train is passing, and they, they somehow resemble the movement of the train. And now and then, a small uh, smell of grass displaces the reek, the bad smell, the stink of button carriage clothes until the next town new and nondescript new and nondescript so these new cities have nothing as their specific features or characteristics approached with acres of dismantled cars so uh this is not a beautiful landscape to see uh but, but anyway he's describing everything uh, realistically at first i didn't notice what a noise the weddings made each station that we stopped at, we stopped at. Sun destroys the interest of what's happening um, in the shade. So at first, he doesn't um, notice the stories, the origins of these noises, because uh, it's a hot day, it's too sunny, so he prefers not to look outside. And down the long, cool platforms, whoops and squirrels, uh, uh, whoops means, uh, shrill cries of the weddings i took for porters larking with the males at first he thinks that it is actually the chit chat of the porters and the males but actually it is the sounds of the wedding and went on reading so he prefers not to look outside rather he is reading his book once we start, and you see his um let's say primary indifference towards what is happening outside or um, to the people with it. We see a, um, a tinge of elitism here, but, let, but let's uh, read the rest of the poem. Once we started though, we passed them grand and pomaded. Uh, pomaded means uh, oily kind of hair, knitted the shiny hair because it's a marriage, girls in parodies of fashion. In parodies of fashion because these girls are not rich and uh, that are kind of, uh, um, upper class uh, weddings cannot happen to them, so they try to parody it. They they just wear something which resembles what rich people uh, wear and things like that heels. So how they parody it by wearing high heels and wearing veils, all posed irresolutely, watching us go. So this um, uncertainty is somehow grabbing the attention of the poet so he thinks that maybe marriage is uh, is happening alongside um some unclear kind of vision um and if you're blurry if you have a blurry vision while you're getting married and he can see that dubiousness and uh, that state of uncertainty in the faces of these uh brides and bridegrooms as if out of uh, and, and now he's uh, resembling the marriages to another thing, as if out on the end of an event waving goodbye to something that survived it. So these marriages are so unlike marriages that uh, that they are like the ending of a marriage, not not the marriage itself. Struck, I learned more uh, promptly out next time. So now his attention is grabbed. Uh, more curiously and he sees uh, the marriages and so it all again in different terms. So now he's noticing everything, uh, things appear um, in different terms to him. The fathers with broad belts under their suits and seamy foreheads. Uh, so these are the fathers, uh, mothers loud and fat and uncle um, shouting smart, using dirty words, and then the perms 
uh, perms are these uh, curls, the perms, the nylon gloves. Nylon gloves, uh, as uh, these uh, these brides cannot afford uh, silk gloves, so they, they use nylon gloves, which is um, somehow shining, um, and splashing uh, some some light, uh, but but it's not actually silk and jewelry substitute so they use fake jewels instead of uh, the original ones uh, and then they, these are the colors the lemons mauves and olive ochres uh, they so they wear some colors uh, as crowns so that they can be distinguished from the rest of uh, the guests marked off the girls and really from the rest so they are not really different from the other people around but but because of those colors they seem somehow different yes from and yes he's now going to utter a fact yes from cafes and uh banker holes and yards and blunting grass from all those luxurious kind of marriages coach party nexus the wedding days were coming to an end so this is the ending of of those events this is the finale all down the line fresh couples came aboard uh aboard the train the rest to ground and the other people are mm, around them talking to them the last confetti and advice were thrown. These are confettis and advice. So and the, the, the last things to be told to the bride and the bridegroom. And as we moved, each face seemed to define just what it so departed. So everyone um, has their own uh, point of view and attitude about these marriages. Children frown at something, though they, they, you see children most of the times do this. Uh, when they when we are after an event, when uh, everything is ending, they, they don't like it, they, they, they want to continue, so they start to cry. Children frown at something, though fathers had never known success so huge and wholly farcical. Uh, you see his ironical language, success so huge, Holy farcical, and even sarcastic. Uh, they, they they think that to to help a child or to to have a child who is married is a great big success, but actually it's nothing. It's farcical. It's not a success. It's, it's even um, and this is the point of view of the poet. It's not even not only it's, it's not a it's not a win. It's a loss. They uh, and, and now he explains to us uh, why he thinks so. The women. Why? The, because women knew the women share the secret like a happy funeral. So it's not only not a happy occasion; it's a happy funeral. It's like 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 burying something, uh, something precious, someone who is loved, um, under under a heavy bulk of soil. While girls gripping their handbags, the women who are already married knew about it. They, they knew that it's not happy, that they, they, there are many responsibilities after that, motherhood and many other things. They love, they, they love the burden of life. Why girls, why unmarried girls are happy about it? They, they, they are somehow waiting for this to happen to them. They are expecting, ripping their handbags tighter, started and um, steered at a religious wounding. So marriage is called a religious wounding. In this Vera sentence, we not only see uh, the poet's attitude towards marriage, but also towards religion. So it's a religious wounding. Free at last, and he thinks now, he's set free now, and loaded with the sun, some of all the, the all they saw, we hurried towards London. Now everyone is on the train, they start, uh, they start the rest of the journey towards London, shuffling guts of steam like this now fields were building pots now they are getting near to this uh, to the outskirts of the city because the city needs uh some resources for food and there are many farms around a big city like like london so they see that the fields are no more wild they are building plots of farms and poplars cast long shadows poplars are these trees long shadows over major roads and for some 50 minutes that in time would seem so they are 50 minutes ahead of uh, getting to the city just long enough to settle hats and say I nearly die so it's, and then it's time enough for some nagging and then you're there at your destination a dozen marriages got underway so that 
he sums up that many newlyweds are now in the train, uh, on the train, sorry. They, they watch the landscape sitting side by side. An audience, an audience is a cinema, he uses specifically British terms, went past a cooling tower. So we are nearby a city anyway. And someone running up to ball like this in cricket and not thought so these are the scenes everyone is watching thought of the others they would never meet or how their lives would all contain this hour so they, they are so freshly um, into their wedding and its happiness they are so excited that they don't know uh what life has in store for them later how life would have uh, uh, would become difficult for them um i thought of london spread out in the sun and he prefers not to think about their futures, uh, but he thinks about his future in London. Is postal districts packed like squares of wheat? There were, there we were in. So uh, now he finds something in common with these couples, though he doesn't share their ways of thinking. Anyway, there is something which attaches him to them. Uh, and th this is the destination, the city, London. And as we raced across bright knots of rail, past standing Pullmans, Pullmans are uh, railway saloons, um, walls of blackened moss because we are in a, uh, and they, they are now uh, in a polluted city, uh, came close and it was nearly done. The frail traveling coincidence, this delicate traveling coincidence, because there were so, so many brides and bridegrooms in the train, and what it held suit ready to be loosed with all the power. And now he sees the power of these couples that being changed can give. So at first, maybe he's critical of marriage. It's a religious warning. It's a happy funeral. But now he, he, he can see it's, it's a kind of spark of change. Uh, which can happen via these marriages. Why? Because these couples can reproduce, they can have children, so a new generation uh, would be uh, the result of all these marriages, and a new generation can uh, can bring some hopeful moments uh, for the older generation who had undergone wars and so many other difficulties. But slowed again, and as it tightened breaks to code their soul, that sense of soaring, a sense of falling, swelling like 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 the moment when it was is up, it, it, the sky wants to rain, a sense of falling like an arrow shower. Indeed, an arrow shower. An arrow shower can also have some sexual undertones, like um, the, the a, a phallic kind of symbol. A sense of falling like an arrow shower, stand out of sight somewhere, becoming rain. So. Now we can hope that a rain would come over this wasteland. Uh, the rain which is much rated in the wasteland of T.S. Eliot because there, is, uh, there are no reproduction and uh, new uh, uh, regenerations in a poem. It seems that it's happening after all here in Fip Larkin's poem. And he, he sees um, a hopeful moment. So he starts with that critical, even sarcastic attitude, but um, he also shows a possibility of change in his ways of thinking. So this was my explanation and I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope I can see you in my next videos.